our talk on the caustic cactus, and it's a pleasure to be a speaker here tonight. And it's actually quite appropriate because this book is an introduction to San Diego County outdoors, and it is essentially more than a hiking guide. It is, is meant to introduce folks to, to the, the, all of the habitats and the, the biodiversity of San Diego County. In fact, we have actually nine habitats that we have in this book. So it's much more than a hiking guide, it is also a field guide. And it's a field guide to over 500 species of plants and animals and uh, a lot of um, information on how to really understand and appreciate the outdoors. If you look at the cover of our book here, you'll see some symbols. And these are the nine symbols that we have chosen to represent the habitats that are found in San Diego County. So again, this is much more than a hiking guide. It is published in partnership with the San Diego Natural History Museum, and it complements a, an exhibition that is a permanent exhibition at the San Diego Natural History Museum, which is called Coast to Cactus. And it covers the entire county. So we're starting from the coastal area, the inland of valleys and mesas, up into the mountain areas and down into the desert. We have almost three, um, 300 uh, hikes options within the book and descriptions of about 250 hikes that, that are found within this book. So again, it is meant to be a, a virtual tour uh, of the Coast to Cactus exhibition at the San Diego Natural History Museum. So we call it the, the, the virtual tour because you can take it with you. But to start, you really should visit the San Diego Natural History Museum and see the exhibition that is found there on Coast to Cactus. And Jim, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the museum now and, and its opening since it's been closed for almost a year and how folks can visit the museum? Uh, yeah, um, it's real exciting. We reopened the museum April 2nd, I think, so just a couple of weeks ago. And you don't need a reservation. However, you probably want to get there a little early in the morning because we do limit the number of people who can be in the museum at any one time. So if you get there a little bit late, you may have to wait till some of the uh, earlier guests leave. But uh, so far, it hasn't been that bad. I haven't heard much about wait times. So I think you can just walk in. Uh, if you're a member, you get in for free. Uh, if not, then there's, a, I think, a very reasonable charge. Most of the exhibitions are now open. Um, so we're open for business. And I say just come on down. And certainly spend time up in Costa Cactus. That is just a remarkable exhibit. And I think I could spend the entire day up there. So, so what we like to tell folks is, you know, visit the museum and then grab your copy of the Costa Cactus and, you know, come out and visit the outdoors and really enjoy the what is outside. And so it is it, the, the, so this experience is just like going on a canyoneer walk with canyoneers. And that's how it was uh, designed to be. It's, it's published in cooperation with many organizations and institutions here in San Diego that carefully went over the book to make sure that our descriptions are correct, the trails are correct. And so it is endorsed by all these organizations that you see up on the screen. And so, and so this is um, you know, one of the things that we're very proud of and it's been uh, reprinted four times. So every time we reprint the book, we update information in the book. So we try to keep it as current as possible for all trail information. It's written by the Canyoneers. Um, which are citizen scientists who are trained by the museum. And Jim, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that program and, and what it's all about? Well, the Canyoneer program started back in 1973. And when, it, when we first started, we led hikes only by the museum, actually over at uh, Florida Canyon. So our original name was the Florida Canyoneers. 
Over the years, we started to add more hikes at different locations, and now we're all over the county. There are about, I don't know, 140 current canyoneers, and their backgrounds pretty much range the gamut. We have doctors and lawyers and carpenters and gardeners, uh, basically anybody who's enthusiastic about getting outdoors and discovering nature in San Diego would make a great canyoneer. And we have a course, uh, I think it's 10 weeks now, every September through November. And I would highly recommend if you're interested, we're actually gonna start it up again this year. And uh, I would say sign up for it. And if nothing else, you'll just have a lot of fun. And uh, we hike, as Diana said, from the coast to the mountains, to the desert. Uh, a unique area we have here in San Diego are our um, urban canyons that really, I don't know another city who has the kind of extensive urban canyon setup that we have. Uh, so another great place to come and hike. And uh, that's probably about it for the canyon years, Diana. Okay, and then uh, a little bit about the San Diego Natural History Museum. It, uh, it's one of the oldest institutions uh, on the West Coast. In fact, it's the second oldest in scientific institution west of the Mississippi and the oldest in Southern California. And so it was also uh, formed by citizen scientists who were interested in researching and interpreting the outdoors, just as the canyoneers are interested in doing that today. And our, the mission of the museum, of course, is, is research education and to promote understanding of the whole diversity of this area, which includes Baja California. Um, the Canyoneers are, are, um, are lead public walks, and as we've been doing this for like 38 years, well over 40 years, um, but these days with COVID, we haven't been able to do the walks, but we have something you can do, and Jim can tell you a little bit about it. Well, if you visit the San Diego Natural History Museum's website, uh, sdnat.org, I think we'll have a link for it in a while, uh, Every season, every fall, winter, summer, spring, we make uh, a recommendation for 10 of our favorite canyoneer hikes. And we give uh, pretty much the same description you'll find in Costa Cactus. And you have a map, or you'll know certain natural history uh, features that you're gonna see along the trail, uh, maybe some history of the area in general. So even though you can't, hike with us right now, you can still hike with us virtually by uh, taking a look at our 10 favorite hikes for that season. And so one of the things that, that we do on this hike, we, we are not fast hikers, we, we move along the trail, but we're interested in actually teaching folks about what they're actually looking at, what they're seeing. We want them to, to, to really look at their surroundings, stop, look, listen, touch, smell, examine, and just, just to kind of get a feel for the nature and, and the habitat and how it changes as you go along a trail. So this is uh, important to us, and this is what we want to uh, have folks understand as, as they do go on the hikes. Now, the book itself, is organized by the four divisions, and we're calling these divisions the coastal, the inland uh, canyons and mesas, the mountainous areas, which you see in the green, and then the desert areas. Now, instead of, of putting uh, the trips in a grid area, we thought it would make more sense to actually divide it up by, by highways and freeways so that the areas that we're writing about in each of the chapters is all, is all within um, an area that you can drive around or in. And you can see the freeways here on this map. And so this is how we have chosen to uh, break down the, the, the presentation of it. So to give you an example on the coastal area, then we have all the coastal hikes are listed, they're numbered, and then the descriptions follow for each of those, uh, of those hikes. Um, each hike has uh, a, a, a cha the chapter beginning and, it's, and it shows these um, symbols uh, next to the map 
And we have the nine habitat areas that we describe at the front of the book uh, that, are, that, we, that are within San Diego County. And you can see the, them here uh, the, with each of the symbols. And then if you look below at the map, you can see that there are symbols next to the map. Those are the habitats that are found on the Hollenbeck hike. So each hike will list the habitats that you will encounter on that hike. And the fun thing then is to try to see how you merge from one habitat to another on a single hike. And so that it begins to uh, show you that the, of the diversity that can be found on each of these trails. And this is the, uh, uh, the, the a little bit on the, the uh, nine habitats that we have identified uh, to describe within the book. And Jim, you wanna tell a little bit about each of these? Uh, yeah, and I'll admit I was I was going to give a more detailed explanation of all of these, but I don't think time's going to allow for that. So let me instead break these down by one of my favorite hikes in that uh, habitat and maybe a couple of the things we might find. So for the beach, salt marsh, and lagoon, uh, my favorite hike in that area is probably Botiquitos Lagoon, which is just up I-5 from here. You've probably all driven past it. And uh, what are we going to find there? Uh, cord grass, quite a bit of it, actually. Uh, Spartana uh, filosa, I believe. And uh, certainly we could talk about the birds because that's a great birding area, but not really my area of expertise. So I'll... Uh, leave that to somebody else at some point. Uh, the coastal sage scrub, Tijuana Estuary is a very good example of that. And we have uh, California and Cilia, and Cilia Californica, uh, black sage, uh, salvia mellifera are two of the major components for the coastal sage scrub. Uh, grasslands, Barnett Ranch, which I admit is kind of close to where I live. Uh, out here in Ramona is a great example of grasslands. A uh, lot of lupins in areas like that, one of my favorite flowers. Chaparral, Elfin Forest is a great uh, hike for chaparral. Uh, we have chemise, we have chaparral candle. Uh, so many different plants make up our chaparral. Oak woodlands. Uh, the Oak Grove Loop and Mission Trails, and of course, then we have all of our uh, oaks, the Quercus uh, species, uh, Coast Live Oak, Quercus agrifolia, Engelman Oak, uh, Quercus Engelmani are two of uh, the major components. Riparian, uh, Blue Sky Ecological Reserve is a really nice example. We have a lot of willows, uh, Salix species, Mule fat, uh, Bacchus salicifolia, and the freshwater marsh, montane meadow, and vernal pools. Uh, up in the Palomars, we have French Valley. And for um, vernal pools, I, I love going out to the Santa Rosa Ecological Reserve up in uh, uh, Riverside County. It's a bit of a drive, but certainly worth it. It's one of the, the most beautiful areas we have around. And uh, then for mixed conifer, I really like Azalea Glen Loop up in the Cuyamacas. Uh, and of course, Jeffrey Pine is one of the, uh, the key uh, components for any uh, coniferous forest. And the desert, this one's tough. This is one of my favorite areas. I don't know if I could tell you a favorite hike I have there or my favorite hike, but uh, Palm Canyon in Borrego Springs is really nice. Uh, we have agave, uh, agave desert eye, uh, California barrel cactus, and of course then in that area we have one of my favorite all-time species, uh, bighorn sheep. So just very quickly a quick rundown of our nine habitats. And I think that's it for that one, Diana. Great. Now, so, so the book, in the beginning of the book, we do describe each of the habitats. There's a, a lot of information about it. And this is an example of some of the information that we give for each of the habitats. So here's oak woodland habitat. You can see 
uh, how much of the uh, area in San Diego County ha is oak woodland. Uh, we kind of give you general information uh, and descriptions about each of those. So this is an example of what you'd find under oak woodland habitat. And then we'd also uh, do mention what kind of uh, plants and uh, animal species you will typically find within that particular habitat. So, so we want to get you kind of familiar with the habitats so that when you use the habitat symbols, you kind of know what to look for and get a feel for the area. Now, in the back of the book, we have a, a listing of all the species that are described in this book. And we have it uh, listed both by common names and scientific names. And then each of those species names, you will see the nine habitats that are over there to the right. And you can see what, uh, where a species, what habitat a species can be found in. So you can use the book this way to get a feel for what types of uh, species or animals, plants that you might find on that particular trail. The index is also very, very helpful, uh, just besides finding the pages of what you want. But you'll notice in the index, there are some pages that are bold and the page numbers are bold. And when those appear, that is the page that you're going to find the description of the plant species that is being um, listed there. So there's many pages that might have reference to that particular plant, but the bold pages will actually give you the full description of that plant. So here we have a thorn mint and you can see that the arrow is pointing to that. And so we're going to go look at that page and you will see that page on um, Crest Ridge uh, Ecological Reserve and you see all the habitats there. And then you'll see the red arrow down there and on the right, you'll get the full description of a Acanthamintha illicifolia. And so this is a kind of full description that you will have for each of the species that are found in the book. So it's an actual field guide. And we do have the photos that actually go with the two so that you will be able to see the particular plant. So all of the, the species that are featured in the book, they have a full description. You'll find a picture of it and, and you'll be able to see what habitat you can find that particular uh, species in. So the, the other feature of the book is what we call at a glance, and it's just the facts. And this gives you all the information that you, you might want to have for finding the trailheads. And we're especially um, uh, want to point out the difficulty rating because often in guidebooks, uh, the difficulty ratings may not be really for the average person. And Jim, you want to kind of uh, talk about how we decided to use the difficulty rating? Well, the, the difficulty rating, let me say, there are difficulties with any difficulty rating because what could be easy for one person might be a difficult height for another. So, the best we could do is sort of take an average of all of our knowledge about a particular hike. Uh, how easy was it for us? How difficult has it been for people who have joined us on Canyoneer hikes? And we kind of averaged it all together. And we came out with a scheme of one to five hikers. So one hiker is an easy hike. That's probably going to be flat, well-maintained trail, not very difficult at all, up to a five, which would be probably a trail with a lot of elevation gain and loss, uh, maybe a rocky trail. Distance might be a problem. I mean, a 10-mile hike is always going to be a more difficult hike than a two-mile hike. So I always tell people to take this with a grain of salt. And uh, if you're not sure how difficult a hike is, you know, if, if we say it was a one and you do it and you say, boy, that was really a lot harder, then adjust all of our little hiking symbols up maybe a hiker or two for your, for your needs. And all, the same is true for elevation gain loss. That is a difficult thing to accurately measure. So again, a, a, 
it's more of a thumbnail as to am I going to be walking up and down a little or a lot or an extreme amount. So don't hold us to if it says 300 feet that you're only going to go up 300 feet total. You may go up 100 feet and then down 200 feet and then up 100 feet and down another 200 feet. So um, with everything uh, hiking wise, you need to make adjustments for your own uh, fitness level, your own ability to uh, maybe handle rough terrain and uh, just take everything, as I keep saying, with a, a little bit of a grain of salt. Yeah, and you'll notice on there, there's lots of information that you can use, like what agency are you in? Uh, what, is the, what are the rules about dogs? Uh, the tra trailhead GPS, we've got the Atlas Square, if you want to refer to that, to the San Diego Natural History Museum website, and you can actually take a look and get more information on the particular species that are found within that square. And then, of course, the, the driving directions for the trailhead. Now, this is an example. Diana, go ahead. Uh, let me make one. Uh, ex Could we go back to that slide for just thank you. Um, Something that I did not think would be of much use when we first did this book was the agency, which you see there listed as a bunch of uh, alphabet soup. Uh, and in the back of the book, you'll find a listing for what that actually means and more contact information for that agency. And these days that's really important because trails are opening and closing almost on a daily basis due to COVID uh, and other things too. A trail could close because there was a, a bridge that broke down or maybe a water main broke and washed out part of the trail, which happened over in Crest Canyon a couple of years ago. So I would always recommend, especially if it's a long drive, to contact the agency and just verify the state of the trail. And just so folks know, the CSP CDD, that's California State Park, California Desert District in Anza Brigo State Park. So that's what that alphabet soup means. And so here's, here's the typical map that we have that shows uh, the trail uh, that, and it shows the habitats on there. So we try to give a, as, as much detail as we can on the map, uh, along with the it's on the same page as the at a glance before we actually have the uh, trail description. And so uh, that map was Lower Willows of the Anzabrago State Park. So as part of that trail description, we do not only the, uh, the description of the trail, but we give the historical and cultural information that's involved with this uh, particular hike and species information and, and why we need to be protective of some of the animals that are found there, and in this case, the bighorn sheep. So we uh, spend some time talking about the, the bighorn sheep. Uh, the book also includes um, all kinds of invertebrates, uh, spiders, insects, and uh, we have birds. We have all kinds of species that, we're, we're, that we do discuss in here. And um, the, some of them are, are really interesting and some of the stories are interesting. For example, you know, as such as the tarantula hawk, which is really not a hawk, it's a spider wasp and, and, uh, and the tarantula. And just for fun, Jim, you want to kind of tell about that relationship? Oh, I'm sorry, Diana. I was trying to answer some questions here. Sure, go ahead. What was the question again? Uh, it was about the uh, the relationship between the tarantula hawk and the tarantula. Oh uh, well, that's that's a fascinating, if somewhat creepy story. Um, the tarantula hawk actually doesn't feed on tarantulas. Instead, the female uses the tarantula as a food source for her larvae. So she will scan the, the trails for tar tarantulas walking around, probably looking for a, a female to, to mate with. Uh, she'll stun it. And that's quite a, if you ever have a chance to see this or watch a video, it's quite an amazing fight between the tarantula hawk and the tarantula. And the tarantula hawk almost always wins. So she'll sting the tarantula and basically almost immediately it becomes paralyzed, but it doesn't die. And she'll drag it back to a burrow, lay a larva on the living paralyzed tarantula, and then cover up the burrow. 
And then in a day or a week, the larva will start to feed on this paralyzed tarantula, which is still alive. And slowly it eats away all the parts of the tarantula that won't kill it. So it's very careful that while it's consuming this poor spider, it stays alive. And only at the very end does it eat the vital organs and the tarantula passes away. At that point, the larva becomes a full-fledged new tarantula hawk, comes out of the burrow and flies away. So, so it sounds like inspiration for the alien, right? That's what I always think of. I, it gives me the creeps just thinking about it. Yeah, so anyway, we, we do uh, have little stories and things about each of these species as a funnel spider. And then we also like to tell um, some, we call them trail tales and, and stories and, and interesting things about certain species like uh, for instance, the uh, monarch butterfly that is there, you know, we asked the question, well, is that a male or is it a female? Which one's male, which one's female? And so we want to make sure that our folks uh, learn the difference. And it's once you know it, you can always tell the difference. If you look at the top uh, monarch picture, you'll see two dots that are um, just uh, right, at, right at the bottom of the wings here, but you don't see it over here. So this is a male. This is a female. And then over here, we have a dragon, a dragonfly on the left, on the, on, the, on the right, sorry, dragonfly on the right, and a damselfly on the left. And the way you can tell the difference here, she's a damsel, and a damsel wears a gown, a long gown behind her. So she's a damsel, and the dragonfly is a dragon. And so a dragon has wings that, that stand out to the side. So that's the dragonfly and there's the damselfly. So we just try to tell little stories like this to help you identify the species. Oh, and Diana? Yeah. I'm sorry, could I have you go back that, to sure. that slide just for a second? If you've ever tried to catch a dragonfly, you know that they're very difficult because basically they see you coming and just dart out of the way. If you look at the eye structure on the damselfly, the one in the middle, it has two separate and fairly small eyes. If you look at the dragonfly, it has these two huge eyes that are basically touching each other. So its visual acuity, its field of vision is almost 360 degrees. So if you've ever, if you ever go out to try and net a dragonfly, don't feel bad if you miss 100 times out of uh, 101 because they, they're they just almost impossible to catch because they see so well. And so, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of animals out there that use mimicry, you know, to kind of protect themselves and some will resemble other things for their own protection or as a way to uh, be able to catch prey. So here's an example of um, a, uh, a velvet of ant, the, uh, the creosote seed, and you can see how similar it is and it can hide among the creosote seeds and just wait for prey to come along and then it can pounce. It's actually a wasp, it's not an ant. Um, so you've got the, all kinds of interesting things out on the trail if you take a look at them. Uh, we, we spend uh, a lot of time talking about reptiles and amphibians. Um, I don't know, Jim, if you want to say something a little bit about, you know, what we, what we have as far as reptiles and amphibians in the book? Well, not, certainly not my area of expertise, but I will mention that most of our native amphibians are not doing very well. They're under a lot of stress, either from loss of habitat, uh, invasive species. So many of them are either of concern or actually endangered species. So if you see one of these uh, amphibians, especially our frogs, uh, you're, you're very lucky these days. Reptiles, on the other hand, uh, personally, I love rattlesnakes. I think they're probably our most beautiful snake. The, um, you know, they have a bad reputation. I don't think well-deserved rattlesnakes are not 
born killers. They're not out looking to track down humans and bite them. The bite can be serious and certainly needs to be addressed. But in truth, most rattlesnake bites are probably dry bites. So quite often a person will be bitten and they'll have no reaction whatsoever. I would suggest if you are out hiking quite a bit, make sure your insurance is paid up because rattlesnake venom is incredibly expensive. Somebody told me it's like $4,000 a vial and people quite often need multiple vials. So you don't wanna pay for that out of pocket if you can avoid it. And we all, when we're out hiking, we all carry the most important rattlesnake bite uh, equipment with us at all times. And that's our cell phone and our car keys. If you get bit, walk back to your car, call the doctor, tell them you're on your way to the hospital, and you'll probably be just fine. Okay, so uh, we also have a variety of, of mammals uh, that are in there, and uh, like the section on mountain lions, we're going to talk about, you know, what to do if you encounter a mountain lion, how to deal with that, and some of their uh, habitats uh, where, they, where they are and, and the way that they live, so we, we spent time on that. And coyotes really interesting. You know, we have coyotes in virtually every habitat in urban areas also. But it's really interesting in the desert uh, and, and in other areas because they'll have a, a, a variety of, of things that they can eat, and including plants and seeds. For, for instance, the coyote has an interesting relationship with the mesquite out in the desert because he'll eat the mesquite seeds and go somewhere else and defecate. And actually those mesquite seeds need to run through his intestines in order to get moisture. And then when he defecates, it's got fertilizer. So it's the perfect opportunity to grow somewhere else. So um, that's a kind of an interesting relationship between a, a plant and a, and a predator. Uh, and, and Diana, I just wanna mention, you said coyotes eat a lot of different things. I have seen AA batteries in coyote scat. And for the life of me, I have no idea what the coyote thought it was gonna get out of that. But apparently their thought is I'll eat it. And if I can digest it, great. If not, I'll just move on. And if, if you've been out hiking for any length of time, especially up in the mountains, um, you've probably seen, or I should say, you probably have been seen by a mountain lion. They're incredibly stealthy, but we're not on their food list, so they avoid us uh, pretty, pretty regularly. Usually it's only a sick mountain lion or one that's been uh, hurt somehow that uh, tends to be a problem for humans. So if you ever do see one, consider yourself very lucky and uh, back away slowly. Yeah, and another thing is they, they usually are out hunting at at night or, or early, late late evening, evening, early morning hours. So you, you know, it'd be rare for you to run into a coyote during the day unless he's just sitting there sleeping and relaxing because that's not his hunting time. So moving on, we also have a lot of flowers and, and plants that, that we describe and have in there. This particular uh, palm grove, California fan palm, is Southwest Grove at, uh, at um, Mountain Springs. And you can see beyond the, the Viacito Badlands there. And these are, these are really interesting plants because they used to be covering the whole desert area. And as that became drier and more of a desert, they retreated to areas where there were water seeps. And they have to actually sit in water. They have a short root system. And of course they have this large leaf structure which is constantly throwing out water evaporation into the sky. So they have to sit in water. If they can't sit in water, they will die. And the coyotes, speaking of coyotes, they will, when they can't find water, if they can find a palm tree, all they have to do is dig down and they will find a source of water at the base of the palm tree since the palm, palm has to sit in water and, and the root system is not very deep at all. Um, oh, and Diana, can I say one more thing sure. about palm trees in Southern yeah. California? Growing up, I'm a Southern California native, and the tree that I always saw everywhere, including postcards and on TV shows, were these you know, palm trees you see in LA. I mean, 
just everywhere. And it turns out, as I'm sure most of you know, those are the non-native palms. Those are, those are not native to California in any way. Those are uh, the Mexican fan palm. So our only true native fan palm are these little relic uh, species that are tucked away in these desert canyons. So while probably most of the country thinks California, Southern California, palm trees, uh, really not the case. Well, I can, I, I can also add that these were very important to the Native uh, Americans that actually lived out in the desert and, and in the areas here on the, on the coastal areas where you can even find some in the canyons. Uh, because where, where you had this, you had a water source, uh, you have a food source in the, in the palm fruit that is there, and then they use the fiber from the palm trees uh, for basketry, for various other things. So it was an important um, to the Native Americans and especially in the desert areas because that provided shade and a source of water and some food. So it, it was an important resource for them. Uh, Laurel sumac, uh, taco plant, it's also known as. Uh, so some, some plants, you know, have uh, uh, interesting uses. One of this is used by citrus growers uh, as frost indicators. So, you know, we kind of tell all about it and, you, and where you will find this particular plant. And then there is the lichen. So uh, one of the things that canyoneers really like to do is to tell what we call trail tales. And so we try to tell these little uh, stories about um, some of the things that we encounter so that people can better remember them. And so one of the ways that we try to describe the symbiotic relationship between an algae and a, light, and a, and a fun, fungi is, is in this little ditty that we say. We say Alice algae and Fred fungi uh, took a liking to each other. Alice was a good cook and Fred was um, uh, a fun guy. Together, they set up housekeeping. Alice did the cooking. Fred provided the housing, but their relationship is now on the rocks. So that's kind of the, the story of the lichen. And we try to find little, little stories like this to kind of um, make it more fun when we go along the trail. Diana, I think I just heard a lot of groans as you finished that. No, uh, I didn't hear the groans, but there probably are. <laughs> And so, you know, and then we try to point things out that are important, like, you know, you don't want to run into some poison oak. And there are, uh, of course, plants that kind of do resemble it. And, and Jim, you might want to say something about that. Well, poison oak is, it, it's really a fascinating plant. And when we're leading hikes, this is actually one I'm looking for, for a variety of reasons. Obviously, I want to tell people not to step into it and uh, touch it. But uh, it also is just such a beautiful plant. This uh, in the fall, when it starts to turn red, uh, it's striking. The uh, downside, of course, is most people, about nine out of 10 people get a allergic reaction, get a dermatitis to this, which can be very, very nasty. Uh, can last up to two weeks. In fact, some people even get hospitalized uh, and need to get treatment for their uh, reaction to this. But uh, I always ask people, and sadly, I, I can't hear your, your response to this, but I'll ask the question anyway. How many organisms on earth are allergic to poison oak? I'll wait for a minute and get some, get some guesses. And it turns out the answer is one. Humans are the only uh, creature that has a reaction to this. And so evolutionarily speaking, I don't understand what the point of that is, because obviously we would not bother poison oak if it weren't for the fact that we were so allergic to it. But um, it's actually, um, it can be a fatal interaction. In the winter, when the leaves have dropped off this, it, uh, it looks like a bunch of sticks on the side of a trail. And if you're trying to make a fire, people will gather up these little sticks and set them on their fire and light them and the smoke comes up. And that smoke is deadly. It will basically do the same thing to the lining of your lungs that it will do to the skin on your arms. And quite, you know, two or three people a year seem to die from inhaling uh, the smoke of poison oaks. So it's a little bit of a, of a issue for 
for people. But uh, we always tell the kids two ways to identify it. Leaves of three, let it be. So while they're not really leaves, they're leaflets. You can see uh, here we have three leaves and a little bit of a cluster and two leaves kissing and one running away. So the bottom two leaflets are very close together. The one in the middle is the petiole is a little bit longer. So it's running away. And of course, there are many things that try to look like poison oak, but aren't. Uh, over to the uh, bottom left there, we have basket bush, which looks very similar in a lot of ways to poison oak. It even turns red uh, in the fall. And uh, some people think this was the reason that uh, it was believed Native Americans might not be allergic to poison oak because when the Europeans came into the area, they would see Native Americans using basket bush to make baskets and they weren't breaking out and they just had misidentified poison oak in basket bush. So it turns out Native Americans are about uh, as likely nine out of 10 to have a reaction to poison oak as Europeans are. Cool. And so we also tried to feature some, you know, special plants that are out there endangered or threatened or endemic to San Diego County. Um, and uh, if you want to say a couple quick words on this, so we need to keep on schedule, but how about a couple quick words on, on some of these uh, plants that we do feature? Well, you know, um, it's just, I, I find a lot of people just really want to know where plants that are endangered, or at least rare, hard to find, are located. And so one of the things you can use coast cactus for is to find not only what those plants are, but what trail you're likely to find them on. And there's certainly other resources you can use, but uh, Costa Cactus works well for that. So we have the Nolina bear grass, which uh, I find mostly, I go up to Mount Gower. Is that right? No. Where do we find Nolina bear grass, Diana? Uh, well, in, in, heading down toward the desert, you find it too. Yeah. But it, it's relatively rare. Uh, the uh, Mount Laguna Aster, of course, we find at Mount Laguna. And another reason to go out to the Santa Rosa Plateau is you find the Santa Rosa uh, basalt brodia out there, just a beautiful little plant. So uh, just because they're rare, people do seem to like to pay a bit more attention to these. And, and of course, we have a variety of birds that, that we do focus on and, and describe and talk about the habitats they're in, but I'll kind of um, flip through these real fast, even the osprey that you can find at Lake Murray. Um, and then we have geology. So, you know, we, we try to uh, give a, a, a whole picture of the natural history of the county. Uh, this is Loot Ridge out in Anza Borrego. Uh, it's along the San Jacinto Fault Zone where you've actually got a right lateral fault. You can hike up here and actually just see the fault line uh, as it extends down from uh, Clark Dry Lake and uh, the uh, up to, uh, to following up the San Jacinto Fault. So we've got geology, uh, we've got the drag fold. Uh, you, it's now called a drag fold, it used to be called the anticline. And it is um, the result of a, a subterranean landslide that had occurred. And this earth movement just kind of hit the wall and kind of curled up like you would have a carpeting curled up, loose carpeting if you kind of pushed it against the, a wall. And so it's pretty fabulous. And the, the Anzabrego State Park is really known for its geology. So we try to describe what these things are, what you're looking at. Uh, and so we have a little bit of geology in there. Uh, we also have uh, watersheds. So uh, we, we, we try to uh, point out what, where the water emanates from and where it flows down uh, toward uh, the ocean areas. And so, uh, and the, the whole watershed area, as you can see, that's pictured on here and, and it is mentioned in the book. Uh, Native Americans, so um, we try to spend time talking about the kumeyaay that are found in the 
uh, San Diego area and also the Kuiya Shoshone speaking Indians. Um, we have a couple trails where there are pictographs or petroglyphs that are that are found. This is um, probably the more famous one in Anza Brego State Park. It's called the Pictograph Trail. And it's really kind of unusual because it is in Kumeyaay territory. And yet the design is uh, a design that is more typical of Kuiya Indians. Um, the Kumeyaay design is mainly those that are more anthropomorphic. So it's kind of an indication here of, of how the two groups kind of mixed together and influenced each other. So this is in Kumeyaay territory, but it definitely has the chevrons and the, the geometric uh, designs that, that you find in the Kuiya uh, territory. So, so there's a, we, so we like to kind of explain some of the habitats and culture of the Indians found in the area. Uh, talk about the use of the morteros and the cupules that are found in the rocks and, and uh, how they were used for grinding for some of the uh, seeds that they had gathered and collected. So you'll learn about that also. And so the reason is, you know, why, why what's, what's good about this book? Well, there's a bunch of things. One, it, it does introduce you to the biodiversity of San Diego County. It's a field guide. You don't have to carry a whole bunch of extra books with you. This one describes a lot of the plants that are found there. Uh, you have uh, detailed maps and information on hiking. Uh, it includes historical, cultural, fun facts. And it's just a great introduction for people that are trying to uh, learn about the county and, and trying to introduce them. Um, more importantly than that, all of the canyoneers who wrote chapters and checked on this and did it, we all did this as volunteers. So the royalties from this book all go to the San Diego Natural History Museum. And that money is, is used to, uh, for scientific research, for education, and for exhibits. And so every time you buy one of these books, uh, you are certainly supporting the San Diego Natural History Museum. And we always ask if you find an error or something in there that's not right, please let us know because on the next printing, we will correct it and we will keep it up to date. And um, so, so why do, are we doing this? Well, we, we do this mainly because we want people to learn about the area, about the biodiversity of the area. And then as you start to learn it, you learn to love it. And it, once you start loving something, you, you wanna take care of it, you wanna protect it. So the underlying reason for this book is not only to introduce people to it, but to make them conservationists and preservationists. And just like our Senegalese conservationists here, in the end, we conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught. And then finally, for those of you that are watching this, and if you don't have a copy of this book, uh, you can go to the Sunbelt website because for the, until the end of the month, we have a 20% discount for anyone that wants this book that is part of the, um, the Native Plant Society, California Native Plant Society, or anyone who views this um, program uh, through the end of the month. So take advantage of it, get a discount, uh, support the museum when you do this. And again, we just hope that when you use this book that it will just kind of help you learn more about the county and appreciate it and appreciate all of the, the plants that are out there. And uh, Jim, I don't know if you have some final words that you might wanna say. Well, uh, I do wanna point out, I think a few people have asked, there is a Kindle version of this book. Uh, as far as I know, it's only available on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and you look up Costa Cactus, you'll see there's a Kindle version. Uh, I think it's like $15. Believe me, it is a lot easier to carry your little Kindle or your iPhone in your backpack than it is this book. So if you wanna cut some weight down, get the electronic version. And I just wanted to thank everybody. I've been watching the uh, chat and trying to answer some Q&A stuff. And I just wanna really thank everybody for joining us tonight. This has been a lot of fun. And I, I hope you all got something out of it too. I hope so too. And thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Diana and Jim. That was 
absolutely fascinating. I learned so much and I'm mad that it's like 8 p.m. because all I want to do now is go out on a hike. So, I think we're off the night hike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, there's, it doesn't look like there's much moon out there. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I will. Um, if anybody has any questions, we can put them in the uh, Q&A. Uh, Jim has been very nice and answering people's questions as uh, as the presentation was going on. Um, and I will also bring in uh, the Native Plant Society Vice President, Justin Daniel will come on now. There you, he is. And uh, if he has any questions also for the panelists. Diana, I think I've seen a couple of questions. Uh, there is no... Um, code for getting the discount you basically just go to the just go to the website we we have just marked it on our website 20 percent off so actually you could tell anybody to, uh, that if they want a copy of the book they can take advantage of it but we just thought we didn't want to encumber people with a with a code so just go on there and it's on 20 percent off till the end of the month and the fourth printing uh what's the date on that uh, that's 2020 all right, so that's our most recent. Uh, right, we just pre printed it a couple months ago. In fact, uh, yeah, in fact, I think that the shipment arrived, uh, it's actually a shipment arrived in 2021, so just at the beginning of the year. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim, thank you, Diana. That was absolutely fantastic introduction to the book. Uh, my name is Justin Daniel. I'm the vice president of the San Diego chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And um, more importantly, up until COVID, I was the field trips chair and uh, continued to run some field trips. And I have a, a confession to make that over those uh, five years of running field trips, Costa Cactus has been a bit of a cheat sheet for me and through, through a number of additions and selecting great trails. <laughs> of course, there's a little more... <laughs> work that, that goes into that, but you guys have done an extraordinary amount of prep uh, that's useful for everyone, including me. Um, so thank you for that, for sure. Um, and the field trips that CNPS runs, and we're now just barely getting back into it, are um, more plant-based. Of course, that, that's habitat, that's uh, vegetation, that's the building blocks of the, of the food web. Uh, and typically, uh, and this has happened before, I'll show up with a small group and the canyoneers will have already beat us on the trail <laughs> or will come up behind and pass us by with all of your fantastic group. And, and I apologize because we sometimes steal some of, your, uh, some of your attendees on those trips, people that are interested in getting into the nitty gritty using the lens on some of the plants occasionally. Uh, so as the field trips uh, pick up, uh, they're currently open to members and we like to uh, pitch them out to people, uh, but the groups are still small and probably will be for a while yet. And so use of coast to cactus is going to be critical for anyone who misses the sign up date for those particular groups. And the canyoneers, I understand, will have uh, many trips coming up, but probably smaller groups as well, just to maintain uh, safety and, and cohesiveness <laughs> along the trail. Um, so resources like that, and I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, unselfishly a book also from the Natural History Museum. And this is the ch vascular checklist for San Diego County plants. It's the fifth edition. It's quite worn from my use, but um, you might want to wait till the sixth edition comes out because the curator of botany, John Redman, and, and many of the people working on this plant atlas uh, have about 100, up, 100 species or more to update on that, including species that have been recently described in the past decade as new to science. Uh, and so if you're really into that sort of uh, detailed approach, looking for rare plants and understanding how to approach them, how to conserve them, uh, how to appreciate them and even try to grow them, uh, you know, and find them to grow them uh, through a legitimate way, like uh, buying from the nurseries or a plant sale. 
Uh, please ask any questions at any time, uh, field trips at cnpssd.org or info at cnpssd.org. Uh, also raising your hand at many of these trips, uh, Canyoners trips, uh, CNPS field trips, uh, please do so. Um, so, you know, with COVID, it's been a tough year. Uh, obviously, we've had to stop our uh, field trips for the past year, uh, but there's a lot going on out there. And I suggest that if you are going to head out to the desert, there's a couple pockets of annuals from this last rain that you might find, but it's going to get hot really quick. So I suggest Coyote Canyon, uh, Borrego Palm Canyon, like uh, Jim suggested, that window is closing very quick. And those palms, once they burned uh, last year, are now coming back. So that that's the resiliency of the California fan palm there for you. Um, I could go on and on. Uh, I, I can see Facelia Nashiana, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. I was, just met, I was just talking about that, and I think one of the field trips coming up hopefully will be up to Daly Ranch, uh, where there is a ghost population potentially. So uh, anyway, I, like I said, I could go on and on. So I think next we should really introduce the next committees as part of CNPS and see if uh, maybe those are more of your fit than getting out and and being on a field trip with us, but thank you all. Thank you. Just a reminder that if you want to rewatch this program or if you want to tell your friends about it to rewatch it, it will be on our um, Facebook page and our YouTube page and you can find all the information at CNPS sd.org and hope everybody has a good evening thank you so much jim thank you diana this was a real treat thank you